Artificial intelligence, AI, is already transforming our world and is expected to bring some of the most profound changes in human history. Hello, human. Salam alaikum. But while AI is being created in Silicon Valley, the workers that make it possible are largely in the global south, raising concerns over who stands to benefit and at what cost. My name is Maria Ressa, and I'm a journalist from the Philippines. Through our investigations, I became the target of a harassment and disinformation campaign, receiving thousands of death threats online. I received the Nobel Peace Prize in 2021, an acknowledgement of how difficult it is for journalists around the world to do our jobs today. I saw firsthand the dangers of tech and its threat to democracy. The design of the systems of social media prioritizes the spread of lies laced with anger and hate. In this special series of Studio B on Artificial Intelligence, I'll be meeting some of the brightest minds working in the field today. Our guest this week is Urvashi Aneja, director of a groundbreaking research collected based in India, which studies how tech is impacting economies and communities across the global south. Has big tech taken the place of the old colonial empires? How do algorithms reflect bias and discrimination? And is AI a powerful tool to fight climate change or another great polluter? Thank you. Urvashi, you're based in Goa, India, where you founded Digital Futures Lab that looks at the impact of AI on societies, on countries in the global south. This technology is created in Silicon Valley, in a different place with different cultures. It's coded biases in there. How does all of this play out in India? At the most basic level, these technologies are what we're calling AI is designed without a sense of what the socio-political context in these countries looks like. So a very, very simple example, there's a lot of um, concern that AI is gonna take away our jobs, it's gonna automate our jobs. But if you look at countries in the global south, if you look at a country like India, only 20% of the population actually is in formal employment and has jobs. Yeah. So there's concerns about large-scale job displacement are not really the concerns that we have in the Global South or in a country like Wait, let India. me just make sure. 20% have formal jobs in the and formal it's an sector. informal sector that, that pushes Correct. it. Okay, continue. Correct. You know, we talk about virtual assistance or self-driving cars. Uh, in the places that I live, people don't have access to drinking water, to healthcare, etc. right? So there's a huge, huge disconnect. People are not on the internet. In countries like India, or in many parts of the global south, the use of AI is being positioned as a way to address very complex developmental problems, right? So it's being used in very critical social sectors like healthcare, education, uh, welfare, so mm. on and so forth. But at the same time, many of these countries are very young democracies. We don't have the institutional system set up to be able to regulate the use of these technologies. The platforms of the companies that are building these technologies have also not invested adequately in ensuring that these technologies do not produce harm in these contexts, right? To give you a very simple example, something like content moderation on Facebook. Yeah. The bulk of Facebook's users are in the global south, yeah. right? But a tiny fraction of Facebook's budget is actually spent on content moderation in those countries. So there's a complete disregard for what the impacts of these technologies might be in those areas. So it's the combination of all these factors that I think makes the use of AI in the global south particularly worrying and risky. You know, there's so much to pick from what you said. Uh, in the West, in the global north, if you are a woman, if you're black, brown, LGBTQ+, you're further marginalized when you walk into these social media platforms, right? That's built in. How does that get compounded mm -hmm. when you come from the Global South? Yeah, now it's pretty well understood that AI systems are only as good as the data on which they're trained. Yeah, we right? go back to data. And in the Global South, in countries like India, more than half the population is still not online, right? So these people are digitally uncounted, 
in some sense, mm -hmm. but these systems are still impacting them. So the chances of bias or exclusion are very, very high. At the same time, AI systems or machine learning is a status quo technology. It reproduces the future based on the past, right? And it, what that means is that even the data that does exist already reflects historical patterns of injustice, of discrimination against women, against certain religions, against people of certain castes, etc. So the AI systems will reproduce that and it will entrench it because it invisibilizes that decision making as well, right? So one of the solutions to this, or the way that we talk about the solution, is that we need to build more inclusive systems. What's the incentive, though, for these companies, given that you know, they're driven by a profit motive? The incentives are very few, I think. Right? This is the problem. But we can build AI systems that recognize people of color better. We can build yeah. AI systems that recognize women better. And, and that is, is thought of as inclusion. But the problem is that it distracts from the basic question that do we want these systems at all? Right. So for an example, facial recognition technology, yes, we can make it more inclusive, but do we want facial rec recognition technology in the first place? Or do we want to be using AI for credit scoring? Do we want to be using AI for job applications? Do we want to be using AI to decide on some whether someone gets parole or not? No. We, we do not want to be using AI in those kind of for very critical decision making. So there the question then is not about how do we make this more inclusive, but do we want this at all? Let me ask you about the other parts, um, generative AI in particular. There's a toll on the environment. There's a toll on the content moderators that are actually coming from our countries, right? Tell me about both of those, right? Let me start with the, with the labor issue. Um, AI systems only work or machine learning only works because you have people who are labeling data sets. They have to label this as a glass, this as a jug, this as a table, that as a phone, that as one phone on top of a phone. This is a hugely laborious activity. Yeah. All of that work on the labeling of machine learning data sets happens in the global south. It happens for a pittance. Workers are paid a dollar an hour, sometimes even less, right? So. The reason that we're able to see so much progress with machine learning is because it is predicated on the exploitation of labor somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Very often we think about the exploitation of labor as an outcome of AI systems, but I don't think it's an outcome, it's an enabling condition. Um, you have people who are moderating this content, who are looking at image of after image of image of very, very graphic content, right? Um, it has a toll on their mental health. But that's, that's the invisible labor that allows this so-called progress, right? And I think that's why we get these comparisons made to colonialism, yeah. right? That yeah, we're seeing exactly. the maximum amount of value creation for a very few number of actors who are sitting in the industrialized north because of the availability of the cheap labor in the global south. India for many years was the top BPO, the business process outsourcing center of the world. The Philippines took over several years ago. And in our country, I know that you know this is domestically one of the top ways that we actually get revenue. But the people who were doing content moderation, what are they learning, right? How can we get our power back? Is there a way? If we want to shift the balance of power, um, we really have to empower workers better. There's often this sense in technology policy that technology is moving so fast, policy can't catch up. Yes, right? we hear this. But it's only moving so fast because there's exploitation somewhere else. <laughs> this is not necessarily the pace it has to go at. Yeah. This is not necessarily the direction it has to go at, right? So I think if we actually started paying people their worth and their value, we have a very, very different innovation ecosystem, right? And with, with something like generative AI, the problem becomes even worse. Yeah. Um, something like ChatGPT, it has no way of knowing whether something that it produces is factually correct or not, right? It, it lies. Doesn't... It yeah. gives you lies, okay? It's a bullshit generator, right? I mean, that's, that's what something like ChatGPT is, right? You need to have a human evaluating those responses. Right. Is this the right response? Is that the right response? And then rating those responses, right? You need higher and higher skills to be able to do that as you start going into particular domains, whether it's in healthcare or in, for legal advice, etc. So what we're talking about then is not only that 
there's low skill workers in the global south doing this really menial work of labeling tasks but even skilled workers yeah. right in various parts of the world their job now is to train the ai or is to give <laughs> feedback to the ai right um on my way here on the flight here i was watching a film there was a scene in that film where there's a children's art class going on and yeah. but there's no kids running around there's no paint on the walls there's it's clean it's it's pristine and what are the kids doing the kids are giving feedback to the ai that is doing the art mm -hmm. right so is that the future that we want where those are the kind of jobs that we're doing where our job is to constantly verify whether the chat gpt is producing bull or not so let me let me bring one other aspect because um geopolitical power is using information operations and information warfare in the kenyan elections we did a study to look at um at how social media played in the kenyan elections and what we found were the troll armies that were insidiously manipulating them came from the philippines and, and india Right so these people are getting paid to be trolls is this worrisome I mean of course it's worrisome but I think in any in any war we should not focus on the foot soldiers right we need to focus on those in power and what is driving that war in the first place right and I think there's two things here that are important one is I think we focus too much on content right yes. we focus Agree. on the content on social media platforms instead of why that content spreads yes. right and so we need to focus on the recommendation systems on these social media platforms the algorithmic recommendation systems that are optimized for virality for profit for profit that optimized exactly for profit. exactly yeah. and the focus on content has actually allowed social media companies to use the argument of free speech yeah. as a way of doing nothing yes. to regulate content on their platforms right so i think we need to fo focus on the recommendation engines and what they're optimized for and create safer safer yeah. recommendation systems uh, at the same time now i think the information warfare problem has become so large that it's an industry yeah right i think the data broker industry is billions and billions of dollars right and these data brokers sell our individual data yeah. to companies who have been set up to manipulate us and if we are really trying to address this problem at the root cause i think we have to regulate our data economy we yeah. made a really bad bargain a decade and a half ago when we said that we were okay to give up our data to get personalized services uh, and now we are paying the price for it right where you have a whole global economy that is based on the collection and monetization of our personal data so unless we address that we we don't address the misinformation disinformation and information warfare problem um, and of course you know building media literacy building traditional media institutions we have to invest in that this is part of the problem but wait i want to go back and bring you to environment what is the environmental cost of these large language models huge if you and i were to have the same conversation via chat gpt just like a few minutes of it it would be the equivalent of just emptying out like couple of bottles of water just wasting it right to give you another example the amount of electricity or energy consumption that an ai system consumes is likely to be the same by 2027 if we continue at the same trajectory of the of a country the size of the netherlands So right. these companies say that they're getting better at not killing the environment, right? Mm -hmm. Um do you believe this? No, I don't I don't <laughs> I don't believe it. I think the the issue here is also that the people who are the most impacted by the degradation of our environment are in the global south. Yes. They're extremely vulnerable and they're not the ones who are benefiting from the gains in AI technology. Right. Right? So where the benefits lie and where the harms lie is very very far apart. And that's what's worrying is that we are betting our entire future on a technology that is fundamentally very uns unsustainable and bad for the environment, bad for people, bad for the planet. Chat GPT for example, right? uh they expected the downloads to be about 100,000 the first month it went to 100 million mm. and so now it is out in the wild and mm. we are all training that right mm -hmm. we're literally again i will say pavlov's dogs for people watching what do we do what can we do i think we do have options to me the biggest worry with regard to ai is a concentration of power in a handful of technology companies 
right, without the requisite systems of public accountability. Our markets, our political systems, how we engage with, with each other socially, all of that is being restructured, right, at the whim of a few companies. Um, and that's because they have this concentration of market power. So I think one of the things that we need to do is actually use the tools we have in competition policy to address their market monopoly. There's nothing in the global south right now that actually does this, right? Our countries are, are working separately. It is the EU leading mm -hmm. the way. It is still the West. Mm -hmm. It is still the global north, right? Our, our institutions are weaker, yeah. often more corrupt. Yeah, exactly. And I think that in the global south and in many parts, there is this narrative that we need to catch up, yeah. right? Like in the global south, there's this narrative that we missed the boat on previous industrial revolutions and we can't miss the boat on this one. And so rather than trying to rein in the technology, rather than trying to regulate the technology, we want to emulate big tech, yeah, right? We want to it. create domestic champions. Right. And that does nothing to address the harms in terms of oversight, in terms of accountability. Right. Um, so I think competition policy is key, but I think privacy policy, privacy legislation is also yeah. key. Fantastic. Um, we go to the questions, to your questions. Wow, hands up right away. We like you guys. My name is Chong Yang. I'm Hi. from China. For most part of the Global South, education is a privilege that a lot of people don't have. So as journalists and people who study AI, how can we educate them about AI, something that impacts them the most? I think that's a really, really important question. I think if you look, if I look around globally and I see where the biggest moments of change have come from, it has come from the bottom-up swell of people coming together and pushing back against power. Um, and that can only happen if people actually understand what the technology is, understand what the implications of that technology are, and thinking about civic education is really important. Uh, I think we need to do it in schools. I think the media has a huge role to play in it. I think the media fuels the hype on AI fuels these kind of utopian versus dystopian narratives and doesn't help us get a really grounded understanding of what's happening. I think the research community has a huge role to play in actually building the evidence that we need to show what is actually happening in our societies. So I think it's key that we invest more in public education uh, around AI. Next question. Hi, my name is Aditya. Uh, I'm from Bangalore. Uh, ah. You spoke briefly about the Global South essentially playing catch-up when it comes to technology. How can they balance playing catch-up while still making sure that the marginalized communities in the Global South that need it the most don't get paywalled away from it? I think catching up is not the right frame through which policy making or technology policy needs to operate in the global south. It's not clear to me what we're catching up to. If we're catching up to big tech, or if we're catching up to the kind of business model that is AI right now, that is a fundamentally exploitative business model, right? It depends on the extraction and monetization of our data, and we want less of that. We don't want more of that. The other reason why catching up is really hard with, with, the, with this kind of centralizing AI technology that we see right now is just the cost of building and maintaining this technology. Something like ChatGPT costs OpenAI $700,000 a day to, to actually run that technology, right? The kind of computational infrastructure that is required to maintain these systems is immense. Google apparently spends more on computational infrastructure than it does on people. That being said, I think many parts of the global south are in a pre-AI age. We are at a point of digitalization. So we have an opportunity to actually create intentional, curated, purposeful data sets that address specific problems that face us. So rather than catching up, what we need is a different paradigm in the global south that is focused on addressing specific problems, that is focused on building the data sets to address those problems, rather than the current model, which is just collect as much data as you can and kind of hope for the best. I mean, just to build off of that, right, um, I think one of the key things we need to do is look at how the West is the one that is act, that has legislation out the door, right? How do you stop the impunity? How do you deal with insidious manipulation in terms of how we think you're walking into elections, right? One in three people will be voting in 2024. So this is, where's accountability? And I think you cannot begin to build alternate systems until we say this is, uh, this is illegal. Yes, the woman in blue. I'm Ruby from Manchester. 
So we know that AI learns about us by taking our data and manipulating us, using it against us in ways that we just don't know. But we don't have a choice but to be in these digital spaces now. So is there a way of kind of making friends with AI? I mean, I know we're not going to be besties straight away, but is there a way to at least build some kind of basic trust? I think AI is not one thing, right? AI is an umbrella term for a lot of different kind of computational techniques that are trying to make machines work more like humans. So it isn't an object that we can then befriend, and it therefore also isn't an object that we can so clearly regulate. AI is in some sense a marketing term that packages or repackages a business model based on commercial surveillance, based on surveillance capitalism, and repackages it as innovation, repackages it as something that is pushing the frontiers of science, that is going to help humankind, that is going to help all of us address very complex problems. So I think we need to break away from that hype around AI and be very, very clear on what it is and what it's not. And in that, I think we find the answer to what, what we can befriend or what we cannot befriend, right? At the same time, I also don't think that we don't have any option. I don't think that we are at a point that there's no turning back. Just very recently, for an example, there's regulation in California that allows people to opt out of data systems, right? To have a blanket opt out of the use of their data for a purpose that they were not consented to. That's a huge victory for civil society. So we have more choice and more option than we think. Uh, and I think we have to find those spaces and grow those spaces and not give in just as yet into a, a monolithic kind of AI, AGI that is going to be part of our lives as our companions. Arvashi is more optimistic <laughs> than I am. I mean, I think, so let's just talk about what happens on Facebook, on social media, right? So machine learning comes in, takes every post that you've done, if you've done the dating, if you've done the marketplace, if you've got relationships, all of that is data. It makes a model of you that knows you better than you know yourself, right? right so it clones you. Did they ask for our permission to be cloned? No. Then AI comes in and takes all of our clones and puts it in the mother load database that is used to micro-target your weakest moment to a message. And that's sold to a company or a country, right? That insidious manipulation is our bargain with the social media companies. So, you know, you're, I feel like we need to stop the impunity. Mm -hmm. That's the first step, but <laughs> I've become more radical. In the, you know, Facebook and Rappler are partners. We're partners with every tech company, including OpenAI. But, Eyes wide open. You know, we're frenemies. <laughs> Last question here. Hi, my name is Hattie. Uh, I used to be a journalist based in China. I'm wondering, is there such a thing as an AI footprint, like a carbon footprint, um, and how we as consumers or as individuals, as voters, um, can more ethically make choices about our use of AI? Um, I think there's a lot of potential for us as consumers to vote with our feet on what kind of AI we want in our lives and what we don't want. But we can only do that if there is transparency by the companies on what the product actually is. What was the data it was trained on? Has it been tested? What were the error rates? Is there any cautionary advice when we should use it? If we don't have that information, it's very hard for us to be able to actually take action. Um, I think the analogy to food is quite interesting, and I'm not the first one to make this analogy. Um, till like maybe a decade ago or two decades ago, we were happily like smoking cigarettes, drinking Coca-Cola, eating chips, and we did not think that this was bad for health, right? At some point, there was a realization that this is not just about like individual people having health crises, but this is a public health crisis. Yeah. And so the food that we eat, it needs to be tested. There needs to be food labels that go on this food that tell you that this is the composition of the food, this is the fat content, don't eat this if you have an allergy, so on and so forth. We need that same kind of documentation and or transparency when it comes to the use of an AI system. Once you have that information, then it becomes possible for us to be able to vote with our feet. Right? But if we don't have that information, we're, we're you know, groping in the dark. If we follow what happened post-World War II, humanity saw an existential moment, and it came together with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So many things were formed during that time period. This is one of those transformative moments. And hopefully, 
every person in the room, every person watching, we have to demand better because this is still within our control now. It won't be very soon. Urvashi and Anja, thank you. From thank Digital you. Futures Lab in Goa, India, I'm Maria Ressa, Studio B, the AI series. Thank you for joining us.